From Italian beef sandwiches in Chicago to pork roll egg and cheese in New Jersey, spicy lamb noodles in New York to Cuban sandwiches in Miami, these are the 11 legendary dishes we explored across the country in 2020. A generous helping of golden yellow rice sits underneath 12-hour marinated chicken, seared until tender. Roasted gyro meat sliced straight from the vertical spit. Packed together with crisp lettuce, tomato, onions, and peppers, along with a few delicate slices of pita, served soft and warm from the stove. But it's the extra creamy secret white sauce, a notoriously spicy red sauce, that made the Halal Guys chicken and gyro platter a New York legend. The word halal refers to a specific way of butchering meat in the religion of Islam. But in New York, because of this one food cart, people also use halal as shorthand for a whole collection of street meats, sandwiches, and combo platters. The most famous of which is a platter with only five key ingredients. It's like my, one of my favorite foods to eat. So I came the first time I remember and I ate it and I, I was in love instantly. And it was like one of the best things I've ever ate in my life. And Till we're now. Egyptian too. Yeah. So they're Egyptian. Just feels like. Feels like home. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Combo, everything going in. Same. Combination? Sure. The combo platter starts with a layer of golden yellow rice, which is made from scratch, off site before heading to the cart. This basmati rice takes the longest to make, stirred for over 45 minutes and prepared in 40 pound batches, enough to fill 60 to 70 platters. But really, it's the chicken that takes the most care and attention. It's always marinated for 12 hours. And although the recipe is secret, Middle Eastern street meats generally use a marinade of herbs, lemon, olive oil, salt, and pepper. The halal guys wait to chop the chicken until it's fully cooked. This way, it stays tender and becomes as juicy as can be. After we cook it and well done, we cover up by the pita bread. You will get the flavor of the chicken in the pita bread. Next comes the beloved beef gyro, which is half cooked on a vertical spit. Another secret recipe, the seasoning likely has a mix of traditional gyro spices like salt, pepper, paprika, and oregano. Cooks shave it as soon as the meat becomes a dark brown color, using a mechanic slicer rather than a knife because it's quicker and more consistent. Back at the cart, the gyro shavings are placed on the stove and chopped into even squares. Initially, the halal guys serve gyro meat in long shavings, like many other halal food vendors but they switch to smaller pieces in order to keep up with demand. And finally, but maybe most importantly, comes this question. Uh, white sauce all over? Yeah, just like, just all, all of the chicken. Please. Okay, no problem. Like a lot of it, yeah. You have to get the sauces, most importantly, the white sauce. Um, I personally never asked the exact name of it, but that really makes the meal. It's just white sauce. Right, I think we all call it white sauce. <laughs> Carts across the city have tried to mimic the recipe, but the Halal Guys says no other place has cracked the code. Based on the to-go packets of white sauce, this creamy substance is a combination of mayo, black pepper, vinegar, salt, and a few other ingredients. But one thing we're sure about, the red sauce isn't for everyone. We call the white sauce 911 because it's <laughs> very, very spicy. I personally have not tasted it. <laughs> what? Ever? I, never. I don't eat spicy. I cannot tolerate spicy. The sauce has a Scoville rating between 100,000 and 130,000, which is over 40 times hotter than Tabasco. Hot sauce too? Yes. The cart guys won't let you walk away without telling you just how spicy it can be, and recommend taking a couple of packets to go rather than drizzling too much on your platter. I love the white sauce, and I love spicy, so I definitely love the red sauce too. Recommend both. Next time yeah. we'll get barbecue. Okay. Wait, this barbecue? There's oh, barbecue. dude. 30 years ago, there were few halal carts in Manhattan, until the halal guys opened one on West 53rd and 6th Avenue. It didn't take too long to win over customers, particularly cab drivers looking for an easy way to eat halal. At that time, they didn't find any halal food in New York City. So they came up with the idea, there's a lot of Muslims here, why can't we provide a full halal meal for Muslim cabbies? And it started that way. Now, street meat is everywhere. But those cabbies have spread the word about the platters and gyros specifically from the halal guys. We have deals for cab drivers, okay, like better pricing, couple of bucks cheaper, something, discount. 
Not to mention, there's even an express taxi line for drivers only. It's, it's unfair, but this is their policy, that if you're a cab driver, you don't have to wait in the line. You just skip from here and we give your, your sandwich or whatever the meal and you keep going. So. Halal street food has become a staple meal for New Yorkers and a rite of passage for visitors. The cart has been praised by magazines, radio stations, and celebrities. Just something you have to try. It's like, you can't go to New York and not try Halal, guys. What does it remind you of? Home, love, sweetness, not sweetness, spiciness. <laughs> oh my god, the chicken is so tender, the rice is exquisite, and the white sauce, I would die for the white sauce. Just how the white sauce complements the chicken and the spices that it's marinated in. I really loved it. I regret not trying it sooner. Now I'm gonna spend the rest of my life eating more of it. <laughs> hot sauce or no hot sauce? Hot sauce. Yeah, you have it right now, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, no problem. Exactly. Enjoy your food, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful right. day. Thanks, Ethan. Thank, Thank you. you. Fresh rolls of French bread sliced down the middle, loaded with thinly sliced marinated beef that soaks into the bun, topped with piles of sweet peppers and jardinera, all laid across the beef, soaked in a top secret juice. It's this classic combination of seasoned beef, peppers, and a mouth-watering gravy that makes the Italian beef sandwich a legend in Chicago. There are plenty of spots to get an Italian beef in Chicago, but Johnny's in Elmwood Park is full of customers lining up to get their hands on its juicy sandwich as soon as the doors open at 11. I've been here since high school. Yeah. The flavor of Johnny's beef is different than anywhere else. Been in the uh, neighborhood of almost 30 years, and I love their beef, and it's number one beef in town. I know the beef in the world is better than Johnny. There are a few ways to order your beef from Johnny's. If you ask for juicy, the entire sandwich gets dipped into a container of beefy juices, making the bread soaking wet. If you ask for a dry, then no gravy. If you opt for dipped, then your meat is lightly drenched in the juice. They dip the bun in the juice, make it even soggier. You probably need to take a shower after this. This is awesome. I like a juicy sandwich. Good flavor and everything. Good. <laughs> Johnny's Beef starts off with roasting 300 pounds of a lean and tough cut of beef, either top or round sirloin, to simultaneously marinate the beef and make its famous juice. A special spice mix is poured into the large vat of meat. It's a pretty simple process. Adding the seasoning to the meat, it's just going to cook down. What's in the spice mix? That's a secret. You can't tell no, us? No one knows this, but three people maybe. I see a bit of the oregano. That's it. Some things you can't, they're left, better left unsaid. So now we're just gonna add water to it and it'll start cooking. And who created the spice mix? Johnny. Came from his mother in law way back in the day. And then your son in law said the recipe's under lock and key forever. <laughs> so that's that's secret, can't tell you. Lock and key. Yeah, they won't give nobody the seasoning. Well, that I can't disclose. It's in a lock and key in a vault somewhere. That's a secret. So none of the employees sees it. Absolutely Just not. They will never do that. They don't want nobody to know their flavor. That's how secretive it is. Just the process is more important than anything else. Every day the same way and we're ready to go. The meat cooks in the gravy for a few hours until it's tender and well seasoned. It's cooled off in the fridge overnight to ensure easy slicing. The next morning, staff trim off the fat and bring over the slabs to an automatic slicer. Meat is sliced very thin, as you can see, very thin. You don't want to go too thick. Okay, it's not a steak, it's a, it's a beef sandwich. You want thin, very thin meat that you can almost see through. Once a pan is filled to the brim with paper-thin slices of beef, it's either refrigerated or sent out to the front for assembly. There's 15 pounds in each pan. We cut 10, 12, 15 pans, depending. You know, the weekend gets even busier. The assembly of the sandwich starts off with French bread that's specially made for Johnny's from Toronto Bakery, a local bread company in Chicago. It is long, narrow in shape, and has a thin crust. French bread holds our juice very well with the sandwich, with the peppers, doesn't make it fall apart. That is the authentic way of making an Italian beef. Without good bread, what's inside is nothing.
This is just an Italian beef sandwich, Johnny style. Spoon of gravy, sweet peppers, right there. And what is the juice made out of? Can't tell you. No? No, secret secret seasoning. And then sweet peppers, that's the usual. That's our usual, What yep. about hot peppers? The hot peppers, jar near right here. Gives it a lot of more flavor. I mean, the seasoning enough is, is, is spicy, that just makes it even better. We have our own recipe that somebody makes for us for our jardiniere, but the sweet peppers are made in-house every day. And if you want juicy, do you dip the entire thing back in there? Dip the entire thing back in there. Okay, now we're gonna go to Juicy Beef Sweet. Oh my God, I'm salivating. This is beautiful. And there you go, there's a Juicy Beef Sweet. And what do you prefer? That with hot peppers. <laughs> juicy Beef Sweet and hot peppers. The most common sandwich is a Juicy Beef with sweet peppers. It's kind of like the soup kitchen from Seinfeld. They have to be very specific. Just follow the ordering procedure and you will be fine. <laughs> Medium turkey chili. If you know anything about a hot dog stand or a beef stand in Chicago, you don't say the word ketchup. No, why not? Because it just doesn't go. They'll give it to you on the side, but you shouldn't be asking for it. It's kind of an unspoken rule. What about cheese? Negative, no cheese. Cheese is not an authentic way of making a beef sandwich. It's gonna hide all the flavor that we have in our juice, and you don't wanna do that. People love cheese, but you're not gonna find it at Johnny's. Both the juicy and dry varieties of Johnny's beef have drawn tourists and celebrities into the quaint storefront since 1961. But it's the local community and surrounding neighbors that keep the lines long and the orders coming through. I can smell it from my backyard, so it's pretty irresistible to come and get it. The line gets all the way out there on Saturdays and Friday, all the way down the alley. There's always a line, you know, I, I don't like waiting in line. This is the only line. I'll wait in. It's an amazing place. It really is. It really is nice to see people come in, see people all the time, regular basis. Their loyalty is, is, is nice. It really is. Every day I have to be here. Wow. Yes. yes. And if I'm not, I will put it in a container like I did for you guys today. Right. In advance. So you'd have to kill me if I ever found out. Exactly. <laughs> Garlicky lechon marinated for 24 hours. Paired with sweet ham, brined for seven days. Topped with two slices of Swiss cheese and pickles for a punch of vinegar and extra crunch. All layered onto plush Cuban bread brushed with lard and pressed until warm and crisp. It's this classic combination of flavors pressed between Cuban bread that made the Cuban sandwich a legend in Miami. Ham and cheese is one of those classic combinations. It's straightforward, but you may see it served differently depending on where you go. Like down in Miami, where Little Havana is a haven for Cuban cuisine. And this classic marriage of meat and protein defines their go-to sandwich. Cuban sandwiches in Miami are like pizza to New Yorkers. The Cuban sandwich is the pinnacle, and if you meet the top, then you are meeting us at Sandwich in Miami. For Cubans, we can make anywhere. On a slow day, 80 sandwiches. On a busy day, 150 Cubans alone. At Sandwich Day Miami, Daniel and Rosa spend the most time preparing the meat. To make a true Cuban sandwich, they prepare ham and roasted pork called lechon. Our lechon and our ham, we use the same part of the pork, which is a, a boneless pork butt. For us, we find that it tends to be one of the, the most tender parts of the pork. One gets cured and the other one gets marinated. It's really the only difference between the two. The curing process starts like this. Each ham is wrapped and injected with a salt and water solution made with spices, like garlic, allspice, cloves, and coriander. Then it sits for seven days, building flavor by soaking up that brine. Whereas the lechon marinates for one to two days before it goes inside the oven to roast. And when it's finished, you end up with this beautiful crust on the outside, the gold um, that obviously is contributed through the roasting with all of the sugars and the honey that's in the ham. And so it's nice and tender. It's definitely juicy, it really creates a power of flavors when you pair it up, particularly with the ham, which is a little bit sweeter. What may be as important as the meat is the loaf of bread it sits between. A Cuban sandwich simply wouldn't be the same without Cuban bread. Cuban bread for Cubans is what the tortilla like is to the Mexicans, right? What the arepa is to the Colombians or the Venezuelans, right? It's 
just part of our DNA. But what makes this bread different than, say, French or Italian bread? It's got to have fat. There's a lot of people who may make Cuban bread, but they only use water. For us, it was really important to be authentic and to make sure that we didn't take the lard out of the process because it truly does make a huge difference with the Cuban bread, um, with flavor, texture, everything. And while other spots may opt for yellow mustard, Sandwich Day Miami adds a drizzle of its homemade spicy mustard. And if customers catch themselves craving mayo? I tell them that Cubans are not made with mayonnaise, that I'll be happy to put it on the side, but that I will not be a part of ruining the Cuban sandwich with mayonnaise. After a drizzle of mustard comes equal parts lechon and ham, two slices of Swiss cheese and pickles. I love the Cuban sandwich because there's something about the mustard, the pickles, the fattiness of the pork. There, there's something about that combination of, of flavors that's really layered that hits home for me. The way you really palatize it correctly. Most people put mustard and pickles together and you don't do that. It's too much vinegar. It punches you in the face. It's overpowering. You need to separate them and give it a complimentary meat. And finally, the whole sandwich heads to the plancha, where it's pressed and finished off with one more thing. Once it's being warmed, we glaze on lard, and the lard that we use is the same lard that's rendered from the ham and the lechon that we make. The lard is what really helps kind of diffuse the heat. It's a very high um, heat index, so it doesn't burn, unlike butter. The meat's nice and tender. The bread is nice and crisp. It gives you that crunch. This is how I remember it. Okay, so how do they open up a shop like this up in Wisconsin? Mm -hmm. More than 60% of the U.S.'s Cuban population lives in Florida, and a third of Miami-Dade County in particular, where Sandwich calls home, is made up of Cuban-Americans. Hence why the Cuban Sandwich has become a mainstay here. I have people all the time, everyone comes into town and that's the one question they have, where can I get a Cuban Sandwich? It's part of generations and generations and generations of food. So here in Miami, it's only right, natural when we, when we for migrated here, it was only natural that that was for that to be inherited. To be. It's part of our culture. It's part of our DNA. It's it's part of the fabric of our culinary landscape. That's my Cuban. No one's ever really elevated the sandwich. It's been like a traditional staple with you know store bought ingredients, but no one's really taken it to that gourmet level of making everything from scratch, down from the pickles to the mustard, how they brine everything. You taste it. You taste all the quality. I think the Cuban sandwich, um, with time, has kind of become something we put on the back burner where it's like a really affordable fast food that you kind of just grab and go. Uh, but we wanted to take it back to the old school where people really took the time and care to create their meats and, and to really curate a beautiful sandwich that you can truly enjoy. And that sandwich they've mastered is one of the best Cubanos you'll find in Miami with customers coming from across the world to try it. We've had people come in and show us like a magazines. magazines. Their magazines from Europe says that we must try this Cuban sandwich. And it's surreal. And we're humbled by the, by the whole thing, honestly. You know, you put something in motion, you put all of your effort and love, you feel like it's something that is going to be appreciated. And then once they try it, the gratitude and, and enjoyment that you see in their eyes when they're actually trying it, honestly, makes all of it worth it. Everybody loves a good sando, and every every culture has a sandwich. This is our our sandwich and our culture in a bite, you know. It's kind of the whole package. You get the different flavors, the different textures. I love myself a grilled cheese with an addition of meat, but but this is just its own thing. It's, just, it's the Cuban sandwich. A half pork, half beef sausage, grilled until perfectly charred and brown, dressed with tangy yellow mustard and crunchy white onions. But it's the final touch, smothering the whole thing in homemade chili, cooked down for hours to hone the sweet and smoky flavor that makes the half smoke from Ben's Chili Bowl a legend in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is a city rich in history, but it's this famous nine-block stretch on New Street, once known as Black Broadway, that has contributed to some of the city's most defining moments. And while this block has struggled through generations of ups and downs, Ben's Chili Bowl, which first opened its doors on August 22, 1958, was there through it all. It tastes the same way that it did like 10 years ago, and my grandparents stayed it's the same way it tasted 20 years ago. It never changes. Inside the small kitchen that has kept Washingtonians fed for generations is a world of secrets. 
So many, in fact, that the family goes as far as to prep brown paper bags full of Ben's original spice mix so that even the chefs remain clueless to the final touches. This magic bag we make every day, and only the family has this secret. Some people get their driver's license, some people get a bar mitzvah. We get the magic spice mix recipe. <laughs> this is Kamal Ali, one of founder Ben and Virginia's three sons, all of whom left successful careers in their own rights to help keep the family legacy alive. What is your mom going to do to you if you ever gave away this recipe? Big trouble. Big trouble. <laughs> she, she's, I'm not too old to put, forget to put over her knee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Mama Virginia agrees. <laughs> Oh no, we raised them well. The chili sauce begins with simple, fresh ingredients. Ground beef topped with roughly chopped white onion, green peppers, and tomatoes, loaded into a large stock pot. Chain restaurant, and other people are making it. They're gonna have exact measurements and everything. This is how we do it here. This is how we do it here, Jim. Okay. We're just gonna toss in these peppers and onions, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna get it a good covering. Once all the ingredients are combined and covered with liquid, the sauce is left to boil and bubble for about an hour and a half until the meat is cooked and the vegetables are nice and soft, ensuring a silky, smooth texture. When it's cooked down to about half the amount, the pot is left to simmer for an additional 45 minutes so that the flavor can really develop. So now it's simmered, all those spices are getting together in there and having a party. <laughs> Kamal kicked us out of the kitchen to add some Ali family secret finishing touches. But when we came back, the chili was reduced down to a rich and creamy sauce that he churns with a metal spoon to add in some air and positive vibes. We add in some community spirit. We add in lots of love. Mm -hmm. A little bit of Black Lives Matter this year. Every year. Of course, every year. And we come out with this nice, smooth consistency. After the chili sauce is left to cool on a bed of ice, it's taken to the production line, where the iconic half smoke really comes to life. The half smoke is unique to Washington, and it is Washington's signature dish now. It begins with a half pork, half beef sausage cooked on a hot griddle until charred on all sides. The sausage is placed on a lightly steamed bun before being doused with yellow mustard, sprinkled with chopped white onion, and finished with that famous chili sauce. The meat is perfectly seasoned, except I got the bun, crispy on the outside, juicy on the inside, chili, laced up. The mustard gives it that little tang, good to go. I'm a native Washingtonian, so um, you can't live in Washington, D.C. and not come to Ben. It's made with love. This family who built this is a love story, yes. you know, and it's an uh, African-American black love story. The love story that built this empire began with Ben and Virginia Ali over 60 years ago, when he stopped by the bank she worked at and decided to chat her up. He had the nerve to ask me to call. He wrote a little note with his phone number and his name. Of course, I didn't call him. This was 1957. You don't call a man you don't know, and the rest is history. We had 51 years together before he died, yeah. Quickly into their relationship, Ben and Virginia decided that they wanted to own their own business. Having worked in restaurants to pay his way through university, the two decided to lean into a tasty chili recipe Ben had cooked up. We needed an ideal location. We found that ideal location in this community on a street called Black Broadway. And just like that, Ben's Chili Bowl was born. In the early days, the newlyweds worked day in and day out serving the affluent Black community of Black Broadway standing as a meeting ground for some of the biggest names in history. Everyone from Duke Ellington to Stokely Carmichael to MLK himself have swung by for a bite of the half smoke. Dr. Martin Luther King had a satellite office at 14th and U. So whenever he was in town, he'd pop into the Chili Bowl. We'd have an opportunity to just chat with him for a few minutes and listen to his dream. And the March on Washington that took place in 1963, we were a part of, and we were here to perhaps prepare food for some of those folks that came in very early. So it breaks my heart today to see that we're still now struggling and fighting for those same basic human rights that we fought for so many years ago. This is the revolution! Already active community leaders in the civil rights movement, when protests broke out after the assassination of MLK, Ben's was one of the only businesses allowed to stay open, feeding protesters as well as first responders late into the night. Now, Stokely Carmichael told me that he had a talk with the uh, commander and said, we need a place together. We need a place for the city officials, for even activists, and, and for 
the first responders to be able to come in and feel safe and have something to eat. It was just a, a meeting place for the civil rights movement, for entertainers, celebrities, no matter what was going on in the country or around the world, Ben's had his hand on the pulse of the community. It was a usual place for unusual people to come, and everybody could be usual, you know what I mean? And meetings have been held in some of these booths, meetings that impacted people's lives all over the country. Destruction from the protests caused residents to flee the area, and this community continued to face detrimental setbacks over the decades, from drug trafficking into the black community in the 70s, to disruptive metro construction throughout the 80s and large-scale gentrification through the 90s, all of which, over time, effectively erased Black Broadway off the map. Through it all, Ben's Chili Bowl has remained, even becoming Obama's first surprise pit stop leading up to the 2009 inauguration. But despite the hype, Virginia lives to make sure the place feels like home to everyone who walks in. She and Ben, during his lifetime, they brought along their family so that their family would continue along after them. And that is an important thing because Ben is gone, and one day I'll be gone and Virginia will be gone, but the legacy of the Chili Bowl will continue to live because the children have made that a part of what they do. It's a family affair, and I'm so, so grateful for that. I like being able to come in and meet and greet our patrons and treat them as guests coming into my home. It's been a, an interesting 62 years. I've not had a boring moment. It's very tasty. Have you tried one? <laughs> if I'm being perfectly honest, I've somehow gotten through my life without ever having a chili dog, so I have absolutely no idea what to expect from this, but I will say, just smelling it, it smells like summer. It smells like a family barbecue. It smells like sweet and a little bit spicy. It's goddamn a critique. This is so good. So the chili doesn't have a lot of texture to it, which is where the onions come in. The onions add that crunch that you really want, that fresh, sweet crunch. The mustard on top adds like a little bit of a sweetness, but the chili overall, it's thick, it's rich, it's spicy, but in that way that it's like a flavorful spice, it's not a hot spice, so it feels like you could just keep eating it because it's never gonna like hurt your mouth. I've never had a chili dog before and it's so much better than I was expecting. Like I feel like I've been missing out on this my entire life. When I came here, my hair was long as yours, but look what happened. Them chili dogs are delicious. <laughs> Fresh dough cut into perfect rounds. Dozens fried in piping hot oil, a minute on each side. Only flipped when golden brown and lightly crisp. Stacked up on a long rod and drenched in a thick honey glaze. Hung up on two metal hooks to let the excess glaze drip down so that each donut is evenly coated and perfectly sweet. It's the special way that this simple dough is fried and glazed that make Peter Pan's Donuts a legend in Brooklyn and beyond. Hours before customers fill the stools at the U-shaped countertop, bakers at Peter Pan are busy making donuts. This is definitely a Greenpoint staple. People wait here for 45 minutes, an hour, just to get a donut. I got a donut. It's no lie, it's no lie. Bakers come to work at midnight to make dough from scratch. They start with the shop's popular yeast donuts, since those take the longest to make. Bakers measure out flour and sugar with a scale before dumping each ingredient into an industrial steel mixer. The mixer blends flour, sugar, milk, butter, and eggs. On a typical day, bakers go through about 40 pounds of flour to make a thousand donuts. The only machine left back there is to mix it, but everything is done by hand. Uh, you saw he was hand cutting every donut and hand glazing them, and it, it makes a difference. Bakers roll the dough about an inch thick. Any thinner and the donuts will shrink too much when they fry. Then they cut the donut into perfect rounds, some with holes and others without, depending on whether the donut has a filling. Now the donuts head into the proofing cabinet to rise. Typically, yeast donuts need about three hours to rise, which is why bakers start their shift overnight. But the timing can change based on a few factors, like the weather that day. In the winter, Peter Pan's donuts can take up to four and a half hours to rise. But when it's hot or humid, it's much less than that. Summertime with the humidity, I mean, you, you don't even have to put them in the proof box, you know, as you're cutting them and leaving them on the rack. They are proofing. About 35 donuts fry until they turn golden brown, about a minute on each side. 
Yeast donuts head directly to the glazing station, but cake donuts need to cool for a few minutes, otherwise they'll break apart. Bakers line up 10 donuts on a long rod and submerge them into a thick honey glaze. They hang the rod on two metal hooks because... If you just leave it flat, it sort of sits on the top and it's too sweet. This way it really runs off the whole donut. There's blueberry buttermilk, sourdough, and the shop's best sellers, honey dipped and red velvet cake flavors. I don't think you can come here and not get a glazed donut. It's just like your classic go-to donut. Not too much going on. Simple, airy, but yet filling and glazed like just as well as all the others. That glaze is everything. That's the best part about this donut, to be real, to be honest. The red velvet's good. I love red velvet flavoring, but the glaze is like such an even coat and thin. It looks like they're soaking the glaze onto each donut, but it's actually just like a thin coating that dries perfectly on top, and it spreads so well throughout. Both the classics and the new varieties have drawn in tourists, celebrity customers, and movie crews over the last 70 years. But it's the faithful locals that keep the shop so busy. I've been in the neighborhood for eight years. I have breakfast here three times a week at least. This donut is just so good, and it's not just for the police. It's for the mail lady. Six circles of pork rolls sliced a half inch thick, seared on the flat top until the edges are crisp. Stacked with two fried eggs and four slices of yellow American cheese. Sandwiched between a hard Kaiser roll. It's this contentious cured ham that made the pork roll egg and cheese a legend in New Jersey. In other parts of the country, a breakfast sandwich typically means egg, cheese, and some sort of meat. But at Slater's Deli in New Jersey, the sandwich wouldn't be complete without pork roll, or... I usually call them Taylor ham, I'm from North Jersey, but I've been practicing. Pork roll is a smoked ham that's already pre-cooked that people eat as a breakfast sandwich, and it's a religion in New Jersey, an absolute religion. I mean, people are nuts over it. It's like nothing you've tasted. It's very salty, very oily, but you want the oil, right? Because that's what, you know, you put it on a roll and it's great. The smoky, salty, processed meat is sold like this, in hefty six pound logs of ground pork that's been spiced, smoked, and cooked before it's shipped to delis across New Jersey. The pork will get sliced on number eight all the time. This way it's the same thickness and the same texture all the time. If it's sliced too thin, it'll shrink up on the grill and it just won't be the same. Even though the product is pre-cooked, Ralph sears it on the flat top for three to four minutes. If somebody asks for a well done, I got the weight I put on it. So it gets kind of crisp yeah, around the edge. Yeah, it makes it quicker. He makes those slits along each slice, otherwise the meat would curl up while cooking. Meanwhile, Ralph fries two eggs and tops each with a slice of yellow American cheese. This is an old trick. A little bit of water, a lot of steam. Watch, watch. It's amazing the way it melts the cheese. All six slices of pork roll, eggs, and cheese are sandwiched between a hard Kaiser roll. If you ask Ralph, the eggs go on the top or between the pork roll, but never below. If you put the egg on the bottom, when you go to cut it, it just falls all over the place. There's no way it's going to stay together. So it has to be done that way. Ralph opts for a brand of pork roll called Taylor, which is where the debate over the true name of this meat begins. The story goes that a man named John Taylor created the first pork roll, originally calling it Taylor's Prepared Ham. He was forced to remove the word ham from the name because it didn't meet the definition of ham created by the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. So he decided to call it John Taylor's original Taylor pork roll instead. Hence the confusion. I call it Taylor ham. Pork roll, I call it pork roll. My mom's from North Jersey, so I grew up on Taylor ham and cheese. But if you look at the package, it says Taylor, so they're kind of right. <laughs> What's the right answer? I, it's pork roll to me. While there's no official line separating the people who call it pork roll versus those who say Taylor ham, according to Ralph... The cutoff's Woodbridge, usually. After Woodbridge, it's pork roll. If you go further north than Woodbridge, it's Taylor ham. That's, that's the cutoff I see. Forget what you call it. One thing is for sure, pork roll egg and cheese is a rite of passage in New Jersey. No matter which way about the yard is, we can sell nothing else, but we will sell tons of pork roll. How many uh, pork roll cases would you say you go through in a week? In the summertime, probably 50. 
50 cases, how much do these of those weigh? Six pounds, so 300 pounds a week. Damn, that's a lot of portable. That's a lot of processed meat. In other words, there's not a lot of, not a lot of healthy people coming in here, that's for sure. <laughs> there's nothing really nuts about it. I mean, it's just something that people grew up on here and it stuck with them forever, you know what I mean? And you can't get it anywhere else. There's no other state you can get it from. You can buy it in a supermarket in other states in the packages, you know what I mean? The pre-sliced packages, but it's not the same. Can I get a flat? Woo! Been a while since I've said that. Been a while since I've worn jeans. Girl egg and teas. It looks messy. Okay. First impression. I'm familiar with the sandwich, very familiar being from New Jersey, but this thing is the largest pork roll egg and cheese sandwich I have ever seen. And I'm just gonna try to attempt to, you know, eat it in a good solid bite. If you've never had pork roll, I think you would be surprised by how salty it is because it's definitely saltier than regular ham. And then also if you think about Canadian bacon and how thick that is, it kind of resembles that but it's also a meat and a product all of its own. It has like just a uniquely salty, spicy, smoky flavor. And this bee wants it too, whoa. Okay, in terms of texture, it's thick. It's a little bit crisp on the outside, but it's not like crunchy in any way. It's like in the field of breakfast meats, like bacon or sausage, just hits different sometimes. I, don't know, I can't describe it. I don't. I don't even know where it comes from. Could you imagine eating that entire sandwich? Six slices of pork roll is a lot. Normally, a normal pork roll, egg, and cheese, from what I have seen, is like two to three slices max. And then your egg and your cheese, and you know, you got your whole complete meal. But to have six slices, that is a meal in itself. I, though I do enjoy pork roll, this you have to love it to have this much of it in a sandwich. It's a taste of my childhood, I guess, is the best way for me to explain it. You know, my mom always made it at home, or we went to the deli and got it. So, it's a Jersey staple. I have trained myself for this video to say pork roll. Otherwise, it's obviously Taylor Ham. It's pork roll. Oh my god, Nicole. <laughs> Pastry dough mixed until soft, patted down and rolled an eighth inch thick cut into perfect two inch squares that fly through the air into piping hot oil, fried until puffy and golden brown, finished off with a sweet blanket of powdered sugar. It's the expert way that these pastries are cut and fried that makes Cafe Du Monde's beignets a legend in New Orleans. People compare beignets to donuts, funnel cake, and other sugar topped fried pastries. But those who've been to Cafe Du Monde know them as a thing all their own. It's our like decadence. It's it's who we are. I mean, it's everything about it. You come here, it. it I can't describe it. I'm just looking at it because it's like heaven in a bag. Beignets start out as a simple pastry dough at Cafe Du Monde, where the bakers are meticulous in the way they mix each batch. Mix until it get all the lumps out. Until it get smooth. It's about ten minutes. The most. As for what's inside that mixture? I, I can't tell you that's a secret. <laughs> Based on the ingredient list from Cafe Du Monde's own beignet mix, the dough is made with wheat and barley flours, buttermilk, salt, and sugar. Once it's fully combined, only touch can tell whether it's ready. I check it to make sure it's, it's the right feeling for it to throw. I don't want it too soft, I want it just right. I don't want it too hard. See, I have to feel it. If I make it too stiff, beignets will start to shrink up. Then Curtis puts the dough through a rolling machine. I'm rolling it down so I can run it through the cutter, brush the excess flour off, get it ready to go into the grease. You ever burn yourself during that? Uh, plenty of times. Still had the marks on my arm. Cafe Du Monde fries beignets in cottonseed oil because... It's like a peanut oil where the grease doesn't burn that fast. You know, you cook it at a high temperature. You'll see Curtis shake the squares continuously as the pastries cook. I'm, I'm separating them so they won't stick together so all of them come out done. In five minutes or less, the beignets are puffy and golden brown. At this point, wait for the waiters to come in and bag them up and take them out to the window. They serve. Shovels of powdered sugar empty into the bags immediately after the beignets leave the fryer. That's when the sugar easily clings to the surface and when the pastries taste their best. You have to get them hot, like extremely hot, because it's like, you see that? Like, it's so airy and light. I gotta take another bite. I learned the wisdom of God. A few 
<laughs> it's so oh, good. <laughs> better than a donut. Way better than a donut. It's just soft and chewy and excellent. And we always wear black so that we can have powdered sugar all over us and everybody knows where we've been. Most customers like a lot of sugar. They, they like a lot. Do they come back asking for more? Yes, they do all the time. All the time. Café du Monde has been open in the French Quarter for almost 160 years, all the while serving the same two items on the menu. With some black coffee, it's just like the perfect combination. Yeah, it's a perfect Amazing. mixture of tart and, and sweetness that it kind of just, it totally combines with each other. And for decades, food publications, famous figures, and customers from all over the world have praised the sweet fried dough. There are a few things that you think of New Orleans immediately, the river, the cathedral, Pat O'Brien's Hurricane maybe, a Cafe de Mont Beignet. This is what you come to New Orleans for. First stop when we get to New Orleans. This is on the list of where we gotta go. Even if you don't like beignets, you kind of have to try it because it's just part of the, the New Orleans tradition and history and culture. Fresh plantains, fried, smashed, and fried again to crispy perfection, topped with lettuce, tomatoes, and thinly sliced marinated steak that melts in your mouth. Finished with American cheese and a heaping spoonful of garlic. It's the way this tender steak and fresh ingredients are sandwiched between crunchy plantains that makes the Hiberito a legend in Chicago. The Hiberito is a Puerto Rican-inspired sandwich, but it was created here in Chicago, which is home to one of the largest populations of Puerto Ricans in the mainland U.S. Throughout the city, you'll find plenty of restaurants serving Hiberitos, but the local favorite is Hiberito y Mas. Un día regular se pueden preparar cerca de 200, 250 Hiberitos. Un fin de semana se, se, se preparan entre 350, quizás un poquito más Hiberitos en un día. Lo importante es que no se vaya sin comer. It's delicious, it's crunchy, it has a lot of flavor. I love it. You can find Puerto Rican restaurants up and down Fullerton, but like my favorite is Hibari Tokimon. This is one of the best sandwiches I've ever had in my life. It's a sandwich, but not like a sandwich traditional, like all the sandwiches come with pan. The Hibari is something outside of the common that is made with plantain, and the texture is very different. Una explosión de sabores puertorriqueños que te llegan a que, que, que tú sientes en tu boca esa explosión de sabores. Hiberitos y más offers several versions of its hiberito, like pork or shrimp, but the most popular version is the steak hiberito. Tú puedes hacer de, el hiberito, tú lo puedes hacer de la, lo que se te ocurra, de lo que se te ocurra que con lo que tú le pongas te va a quedar exquisito. To start off, the meat is stewed for 30 minutes in a mixture of garlic, onion, adobo, and seasoning. La, la, la mayoría de la comida puertorriqueña se prepara con el adobo, el sazón, el sofrito. Una manera es un secreto. Algo así. <laughs> es un secreto, exactamente. Es un secreto. Es bien blandito y no necesita de mucha, de mucha cocción. Para la hora de cocinarlo, que tú lo vayas a morder, la carne quede bien, se te deshaga en la boca. ¿Qué sabor le da este uh, a la carne? ¿Qué sabor le da? Le da un sabor entre... Quizá un poco, eh, queda bien tender, queda bien, eh, queda bien jugosa y le da un sabor entre quizá un poquito por el vinagre, un poquito de acidito por el vinagre, el salado del adobo, queda un sabor, una, una combinación de sabores. Next comes the plantains. De generalmente el jibarito es de plátano verde, es más fácil de manejar. Ponerlo un poquito en agua caliente para que no, no esté tan, tan difícil para pelarlo. Después de esto, y lo cortamos. Porque esto, para ponerlo más fino y que la textura quede bien crispy. The plantains are fried for seven minutes, pressed into a flat sheet, then fried again in order to achieve that crispy texture. Sale así. Para el plátano solamente aceite para freírlo. Es lo único que necesitas. After frying the plantains, it's time to assemble the hiberito. Ponemos mayonesa, cantidad de lechuga, tomate, y viene el principal. The next layer is your meat of choice, an American cheese. Finally, the hiberito is topped with a large spoonful of garlic. El ajo es ese sabor que lo distingue. Que el sabor te sale encima de todos los demás ingredientes, el ajo es el sabor que le 
que sobresale. Y muchas personas uh, piensan que el jibiritio es como el patacón de los venezolanos. Él es, ya, yeah, sí. es, es, es la misma, es el mismo patacón de los venezolanos. El mismo ya yeah, hay una diferencia. La diferencia es que el patacón le pone muchos más ingredientes. Le sí. pone... Oh. ¿Y qué es su favorita? A mí me... El patacón, el jibarito. El jibarito. El jibarito. El, definitivamente el jibarito de viste es mi, es, mi, es mi favorito. Cuando juntan las dos, la, 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 las dos culturas, nos damos cuenta de que la comida es bastante similar, es bastante parecida. I go for the steak always. I mean, I've, like I said, I tried the pork. I love it. But um, for me, it's the steak. It's got great taste. You can smell it down the block. So. <laughs> and is this your favorite spot for Hebrew? Yeah, because it's right down the street from my house. Hibarito <laughs> Simas makes all types of hibaritos. The one that I have today is the shrimp hibarito. The first thing I immediately smell is the garlic. Here I go. It's going to get messy. <laughs> this is fantastic. That's magnificent. So good. Twice frying the plantain really does make this crunchy and crispy, exactly what you would want. And also, also, the garlic that really hits you with all that flavor. Ugh. For me, I love that there's a variation in different textures. There's a crunch of the plantain. There's the soft, supple shrimp in between. And then you have the crunch of the lettuce, the cheese that's melting just right. Yelitsa's passion for the jibarito started 20 years ago, when she first arrived in the U.S. and started working in local Puerto Rican restaurants. Yo, yo soy venezolana. Yo nací en Venezuela. Mi corazón, mi cor pero mi corazón está dividido en dos. Mi corazón es mitad venezolano y mitad puertorriqueño. Yo desde que yo llegué a este país, llegué. Mi primer trabajo fue en una cocina, un restaurante de comida puertorriqueña, y me encantó. Me encantó el proceso. Me encantó la comida. Cada vez que yo llegaba para ir a mi trabajo todos los días, pasaba por el por aquí mismo, por la esquina, el restaurante que está aquí en la esquina. Y, al, y mi, en mis pensamientos yo decía, algún día esa, esa esquina va a ser mía, algún día esa esquina va a ser mía. Se me dio la oportunidad de hacerlo y me decidí y aquí estamos, y aquí estamos Ibaritos y más. Muchos mucho de, de nuestros clientes eh, nunca, han, desde que tienen 30, 20, 30 años que se vienen aquí a Chicago, a los Estados Unidos, nunca han podido regresar a Puerto Rico. Entonces lo que tratamos es de, es de, es de darles un poquito de lo que está allá, tratar de, de traérselos acá y para que se sientan familiarizados con, con, la, con la comida, con, la, con lo que es la cultura puertorriqueña. Eso es lo que tratamos de hacer. Una anécdota, yo llegué aquí y entré a un restaurante a trabajar, yo como ayudante en la cocina, y como a los tres, cuatro días, el cocinero renunció, se fue y me dejó botada. Oh, y yo, oh. yo no sabía nada. Llamar, entonces una persona, me, los dueños del restaurante pusieron a, a alguien que sabía cocinar el arroz y por teléfono aprendí la receta y nunca se me olvidó. Oh, wow. Nunca, nunca se me olvidó. ¿Y este Quizá es la con el ribarito? Con el, el ribarito, con el arroz. Oh, wow. Chicken marinated in a secret blend of spices. Flour coated into every crease and flap of each breast and wing. Dropped in oil and fried until all of the skin is perfectly crisp. Sweet waffle batter whisked until smooth and creamy. Cooked to a golden brown color, remaining soft to the touch. It's the subtle sweetness of the waffle and the secret marinade of this savory chicken that makes Amy Ruth's Chicken and Waffles a legend in New York. Fried chicken and waffles first appeared on menus at Wells Supper Club in Harlem back in the 1930s. Although that restaurant has since closed, the dish never lost its hook on the people here. And much of that is thanks to Amy Ruth's popularity. A lot of my friends, they go to Atlanta and they're like, oh, like, where's the chicken and waffles? Wait, that's not a staple in the South. It's from Harlem. Like, if they're coming to Harlem, Amy Ruth's is always the place to go. For yeah. it. The chicken at Amy Ruth's starts with a secret blend of spices. What we do is, in order to ensure that the chicken is flavorful and, and the season get time to evaporate to the bone, we pre-season the chicken 24 hours in advance. It's like a rub. Then Sister Jeanette dredges the chicken in flour, making sure to cover each breast and the corners of the wings evenly. This ensures every bit gets crispy when it heads to the fryer. The chicken usually fries for about 12 minutes, but the cooks will know it's done when it floats all the way to the top. As for the signature sweet half of this dish, there's Amy Ruth's golden brown waffle. The key to the waffle is so it won't be filled up with gas, is to make it at least 24 hours in advance. 
and let it expand in like a five gallon container we put it in. Is this sort of like when they tell you with pancake batter to let it sit before yeah, you, same, before you same, make pancakes? Okay. Same result. It tastes better and it's better on your digestive system. It's not struggling to digest because okay. there's no gas in it. Typically they make the batter in 60 pound batches in a five gallon bucket. But Sister Jeanette agreed to show us herself by hand. We have never made the waffle mix for anyone. What? You guys are, what's today's day? <laughs> the 19th. This is your lucky day. This is your lucky day, 2020. Okay. Like any typical batter, there's vanilla, cinnamon, brown sugar, flour, and something special she wouldn't share. How you cook is the key. Yeah. You gotta cook with love. You gotta time each ingredient that you put in, because you want it to have a desired fluffiness. She whisks it until all the clumps are gone and the batter is totally smooth. See how it's expanding? Yeah, yeah. After it sits, it's ready for the iron, where each scoop of batter cooks for about three minutes until the waffle is soft with a golden brown color. Dubbed the Reverend Al Sharpton on the menu, this plate is one of several tributes to famous black figures you'll find at Amy Ruth's, and orders for that dish come through in the hundreds each week. When we were open before COVID, right, right. it was about 2,000 a week. Now that during COVID, we are about to 500. 2,000 a week, pre-COVID, 500, per that's still a lot. It, it is, yeah, still a lot. The way that they, they season and batter their food is light enough that it's not too salty, but enough to give you flavor. There's a right amount of crunch, there's a right amount of crisp. You know, you're not disappointed when you want something crunchy. They even give you the condiments, but you don't even really have to use them because the food is so delicious that you don't, you don't want to mess with it. In 2017, the Daily Meal recognized the restaurant for serving the second best chicken and waffles in the country. Sometime when I look out the little cubby hole and look at the people when they receive their food, it's like they're in love. Not like it's a person, but it's something that makes them happy and give them joy. I guess they could say, let me go to Amy Roof and get those chicken and waffles. The enthusiasm makes me makes me want to give more, makes me want to do more, makes me want to try and make everything perfect, you know? It takes you home, you know what I mean? Like, you feel the love, you feel everything in it. It's not a mess, it's always a hit. Like the names on the menu, the tributes continue with paintings of prominent black figures on the restaurant's walls. And if you look close enough, you'll find Sister Jeanette up there with them, the soul behind this soul food restaurant. I can't be anything else but fun and kind and sweet and loving and caring. I grew up in the South on a farm, on a farm. <laughs> Rough life, yeah. but a good life. Yeah. And I grew up with 13 brothers and sisters. Wow. And I am the seventh. And my mother says I was the most strangest one. I don't know. I don't know what that. What? Strangest one out of oh. all the children. I said, I think you mean to say unique and when yeah. I was little. She was like, what do you know about unique? I said, that's neat. Yeah. I know, I've always been like this. I don't know why. It is so crispy. It's like flake. The flakes are flying off as I'm cutting in. That sound is amazing. The sound is amazing. It just makes you want to eat it. That is super different. That is not a typical waffle. I think there's like a corn base in this waffle in some way. I don't. That is not confirmed. I'm totally just guessing. But there's a sweet corn flavor. Can't just make it plain. It'd be like everybody else's. Right. Like I forgot I, I forgot I was eating a waffle for a second because I thought there was <laughs> cornbread in my mouth, which sounds strange. But like I got transported to like a different food that I've experienced. And I think that's because like the flavors mimic that. I love the um, crispiness of a waffle and then inside is just so soft and like decadent. Like it's like amazing. When you put the syrup, the butter, it's like, oh my God, it takes it to a whole level. Um, the chicken is crispy. Then you got like the tender meat inside. Oh my gosh, so good. This is great. Like I want, I just want to just keep, normally I don't take too many bites. I'm in it. I want just, the skin is addicting. Like you taste that crunchy, salty, crisp skin in your mouth and you're like, okay, let's just have more of that. Great dish overall. Like, I want to go back in the kitchen, talk to sister Jeanette, try to coerce her to tell me what she put in the waffle batter so I can make it at home. Cause like, that's how much I'm enjoying this waffle more than other waffles I've had. With all of the iconic cuisines that we have in the city, it's nice that this type of cuisine is represented and that people can come to the place where the people are cooking it and enjoy it in its home.
Thick strips of dough pulled to arm's length, slapped down on the counter in continuous rhythm. Lamb tossed in the wok, cooked until tender, mixed with a fiery blend of sauce and spice. But it's this signature homemade chili oil, clinging perfectly to these hand-pulled noodles, that makes the spicy cumin lamb noodles a legend in New York. Head to New York and you'll find several Chinese noodle shops dotted across the city. But the wide hand-ripped noodles from the shop celebrated by Anthony Bourdain. This place is unbelievable. This place is great. Come from here. Now this is the central kitchen, where the popular spicy cumin lamb plate is made from scratch. Spicy cumin lamb is a dish that's pretty commonly found in most of mainland China, like northern parts especially. Mm -hmm. But to put the lamb along with our wide noodles, mm -hmm. we're the first to do that. Is that because you guys liked noodles or you yeah. felt like New York would respond to the noodles with the lamb? You know, we were like, all right, something cumin, something lamb, let's make this dish. Okay. So that was, this is my favorite, right? And then the noodles is my father's favorite because he just, he's a noodle person. He's not that much into rice. So that's how it came to be. The noodles start out like this, a simple dough mixture made with flour, water, and a little bit of salt. And then how long can that sit before you're, you have to pull? So David recommends letting it sit for 10 minutes. But if you ask Jason... I said 20 minutes of resting. <laughs> right. Once you take it out... Different on certain things or you pretty much like... I'm pretty consistent. He changes his mind all the time. He's like, a year ago... <laughs> a year ago, he'll have standards like these. And then yesterday, he'll be like, I want to change the weights for this and the... But one part of the process never changes. The noodle pull. Each portion is pulled to order. If they're pulled early and set aside, the noodles will lack their signature chewiness. How do you know when you've pulled far enough? Ideally five feet. Oh wow. All right, so, but I just go by I'm arm. Five three. <laughs> there you go. As tall as you. Me. <laughs> that's about, there you go, that's about okay. right, right? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> For reference. After they're stretched, Jason strips each noodle down the middle and throws it into boiling water. But we find wine noodles better because it just carries the flavor a little bit better. The noodles is always perfect. They wide up, but they tender. They're nice and tender. While the protein may not be the star, the most popular dish at Xi'an Famous Foods simply wouldn't be the same without it. To make the lamb, Jason and his father set aside seven ingredients. This is yang tui rou. This is natural. This is la jiao gan. This is yan. This is yang cong, sheng jiang, qing jian jiao. David turns the wok up to full blast, adding in the lamb first and flipping it almost continuously. You'll see him doing a combination of that. And the idea is just to keep the meat from sticking to the sides because that means it's burnt. Then David tosses in the rest of the ingredients and a spoonful of the restaurant's chili oil which famously flew off the shelves after the New York Times recommended it to readers in May. With a proprietary blend of 30 spices, that's where the signature flavor and heat in this dish really come through. The lamb is sliced thin so that each piece really absorbs all that cumin and chili and spice. Yeah, it smells good, right? It smells amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to try right now or you want to um, give it a try? It's tasty, right? I kind of do. Yeah, yeah, go for it. You want to grab a try? Yeah. Go ahead, guys. Yeah, try. We're, we're casual here. We're not going to pick it up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna give you good, we're good. You got it? Nice? All right, there you go. No pressure, just in case. <laughs> that is so flavorful. No, really, though, like, I thought it was gonna be so spicy in your face, like blow up. It's very and approachable. It's not. Yeah. It's very approachable. The flavor profile of Shanxi, you know, Xi'an cuisine is not to burn your mouth off. No. That's not the goal. It's a fragrance spice, xiang la, you know, so you, you have all the fragrances, you have some spice. A lot of it looks intimidating because it's really red, but that's, yeah. you know, part of the presentation of the dish. But when, it, when you actually eat it, you know, it, it's, not, it's not that spicy. No, it's very fragrant. That's like yeah. the perfect word to describe that. Before the lamb and noodles combine, Jason adds some more veggies, a spoonful of noodle sauce, and more chili oil. 
Xi'an is uh, actually a very historical city in China. The Silk Road actually starts in Xi'an and ends up somewhere in the Middle East. So there's a lot of folks going around, a lot of culture from different parts of Asia and beyond uh, coming into the city. So that's how it has affected our food. You know, it's very cosmopolitan of flavors, even though it's still considered Chinese food, of course. Uh, but you know, thousands of years of history has made it into somewhat of a unique cuisine. What was once a tiny flushing restaurant has turned into 10 locations across New York City. And as the restaurant grew, so did its loyal band of customers. When we found out it was open here, we'd come in like two, three times a week. We even going on websites to see like the ingredients to like make our own, like homemade, but we, I, didn't, I didn't get to it. Then they came out with the cookbook. Oh, I already got so the cookbook. Yeah. yeah. That's the lead. I work right around the corner and our back door is to their back door. How often do you come? Four times a week. This is the most vitamin D I've gotten in like five months. Okay. Mm, all the chili flakes are coating my lips. Oh my God. I'm like pleasantly surprised at how it's not too spicy. Jason has this like sign in the restaurant that basically says, you shouldn't order something not spicy because their dishes are made and curated in a way where the recipe is valued and the spice is kind of essential. That's the flavor you're ordering this dish for. And then just honestly, the added perks are tender lamb that's just beautifully marinated and delicious. And, and honestly, addicting chewiness to the noodle. Look at the way it's coated. You wouldn't get the flavor and the impact of this sauce without the noodle. Like the noodle is there to accompany that sauce and like you you just it carries that flavor throughout this whole dish and it's just like a nice fieriness it's really really good it's a reason to come to new york oh yeah for sure it was worth the stop yeah. yeah try it you will not regret it as an asian kid you know chinese kid you're you're not supposed to go into restaurants but i don't regret that at all you know after 10 years of being in the business i feel like it was the right decision. It's not just about financial reward, it's about making an impact. It's about people recognizing what we're doing as a way of you know, spreading our culture. That actually is worth more than anything else. Who makes the better noodles, you or your dad? He's not here to witness that. You will see it. I think we make the same quality of noodles. I think my father will say he will always make better noodles, but uh, you know, he can say that. <laughs> I believe in my own abilities. Three thin slices of Pullman rye bread, about a quarter inch thick. The first slice topped with juicy turkey breast, another with roast beef. Covered with handfuls of dry coleslaw, no mayo, brined for three days. Secret creamy Russian dressing lathered generously on top. Finished with three slices of Swiss cheese before they're stacked and cut into eight perfect squares. It's this not-so-typical combo that made the New Jersey Sloppy Joe a legend. In most parts of the country, a Sloppy Joe means ground beef or some mystery meat with tomato sauce or ketchup served on a hamburger bun. Oh yes, of course, the big, gooey, messy burger. Also known as a Sloppy Joe. Sloppy Joe, right. But in northern New Jersey, it's something else entirely. Are people ever going to order a sloppy dough and are confused? Yeah, they think they're getting chopped meat on a bun for sure. They have no clue. Do you no tell clue. them? So like, you can kind of tell right away who knows and who doesn't know. Uh, the people that don't know, they're say, uh, you know, make sure it's not too hot and then you'll know right away it's a cold oh. sandwich. What do you mean? Sloppy Joes are a part of our DNA. What do you mean? It's New Jersey. This is, what, this is what a real sloppy Joe is. Behind the counter, it starts with Pullman rye bread, which is rye bread made in a white bread mold, making it square instead of round. We slice it horizontally so we get a long slice as opposed to a short little round slice. And it comes out just oh like gosh. that. Yeah. So we use three slices of this rye bread. So thin. Paper thin. Is there and a the reason that stuff. you don't cut and you choose to slice it on this? Uh, the only way to get it perfectly straight is to use a slicer. Okay. Whereas most bakeries just use rye flavoring, Town Hall Deli gets bread from a bakery that uses actual caraway seeds in the dough mixture giving it a more authentic and natural flavor. And if you look at it, you can tell that this bread's a little more gray than other breads, mm -hmm. and that's from the actual pieces of caraway seeds that's in how you know it. It's yeah. And that's how you know it's really good cool. Stuff. The original recipe was made with sliced cow tongue, which you can still order today. 
But the most popular combo at Town Hall Deli now is called the favorite, made with roast beef and turkey. They slice a third of a pound of each meat before they're placed onto slices of rye bread. So the next layer is our dry coleslaw. Dry. Uh, also known as coleslaw minus the mayo. After they cut the cabbage, they brine it for three days, then drain it three times to make sure all of the liquid is squeezed out and won't make the sandwich soggy. The most beloved ingredient is by far the deli's signature Russian dressing. It's very secret and we make it in house and that's all I'm gonna that's tell you. That's all you can say, this that's has mayo That's all I can though. say, this, this is mayonnaise based and we make this, this mayo in house. The Russian dressing is a combination of mayo, ketchup and vinegar based on traditional recipes. Then our three pieces of Swiss. And finally, a light spread of butter across the third slice because... One, it gives it a little flavor because who doesn't like butter? Mm -hmm. um, Second, it helps it stick to this piece of cheese, so when we cut it, it won't move back and forth. And it also creates a barrier between the bread and the cheese and the Russian dressing to make sure that the bread doesn't get soggy. Wow. All right, let's just go for it. There is no tongue on this sandwich either. Not like the original. <laughs> a little sloppy. It's a little sloppy. The Russian dressing stands out above everything that is incredibly creamy, incredibly creamy. It's really, 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 really good. It's got a sweet tanginess to it. And the butter, that was an interesting thing that we learned, that they put the butter on the top so it doesn't get as soggy, and I wouldn't say it got soggy at all, honestly. And like I said, it's kind of like a club because it's stacked in the way that it is, but there's no bacon or anything like greasy or heavy like that. It's fresh and it's light. So it is very opposite of what other people may think of when they think of a Sloppy Joe. It's very complex. It has a number of different flavors. You have the savory aspect, the sweet aspect to it. It's crunchy, it's soft. It has everything that you really would want in a sandwich. Personally, I'm kind of, you know, uh, in insulted when people say Sloppy Joe's are the mystery meat sandwiches. I mean, my mom's from New York City, so when she met my dad and my grandmother was gonna have Sloppy Joe's at a dinner one night, when she showed up for the first time and it was this, she fell in love with him and the sandwich. Town Hall Deli says it was the first place to serve the sandwich in New Jersey in 1935, but it doesn't take credit for creating it. There's a bar in Havana called Sloppy Joe's Bar and Grill. And it's still there? It's still there. Oh it's God. opened and closed a few times. They don't make this sandwich anymore. But at the time, in the 30s, the mayor of Maplewood ate this sandwich, or a sandwich similar to this, and he loved it. So he came back and he asked the guys here to recreate it, and they did. Some even say it's the best sandwich you'll find in the Garden State. I have had Sloppy Joe's from other around New Jersey, and this, this is the best, best in town. There's delis all over the place that do Sloppy Joe's, but it ain't Town Hall. <laughs>